front lines, which are the boots in the ground, and heaven. So you've got heaven, you've got the front lines, the boots in the ground on the mountains of influence, okay? The intercessors of the bridge, they connect the two. It is a line of communication between the two parties. We will never win the war for the seven mountains of society if we're not positioned in the connecting places between these mountains and are not interceding on the same frequency. In order to effectively do this, we must first begin by winning the war for our families. The family mountain. A war needs to be conducted on that mountain. We need to win that war. Our children and grandchildren are being bombarded by the indoctrination they receive in our public schools, which undermines the truth and revelation that we are trying to provide them regarding their divine identity, their purpose, and their salvation. Got another question for you. Are we listening? Yeah. Have we trained our ears to be acute in receiving God's plans for these attacks? Satan wants nothing more than to keep the church divided over linguistic misunderstandings and misinterpretations. How often have a group of believers, in other words, a church, a network of churches, or even an entire denomination, split because they've majored on the minors when it comes to sp uh, scriptural interpretation, theology, and even eschatology? The more our enemy can wreak havoc among us with uh, this kind of miscommunication, uh, the less unified we are. In the Gospel of John, Jesus prayed in John 17, 21, that they may all be one. If our unification is that important to Jesus, you can be sure it matters to our enemy, who lives in constant fear that one day we may finally come to such a complete unity that we reflect the perfect union expressed between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we display that kind of harmony, we will walk in a degree of power that the world has not seen since the early church turned cultures upside down, they ruined governments, and they shook the nations. This unity could very well be one of the major reasons we have yet to invade the mountains of society. But there are many more. Let's examine some of these other reasons just so we can properly identify the enemy's tactics that keep us on the defense rather than being on the offense. Now, as I go through these, keep in mind that these apply to our personal lives as well. Now, remember I mentioned at the very beginning, some of this stuff you may find controversial, and one of the problems the church has is dealing with truth. Because truth is often a mirror. It reflects back to us what's really there in our lives, and we don't like to see that. Okay? But as a teacher and a prophet, my job is to release the truth among the body of Christ. Okay? Because I'm supposed to help build up, and to edify, and to encourage the church. All right. First one is ignorance. Yes, ignorance. We've somehow convinced ourselves that despite a cultural shift in the moral climate of our nation, Christians still remain the dominant players on the mountain of religion. You know, think of it this way. Uh, we're like the king in that child's fable, the king who thought that he had on these new clothes that were designed for him, when in reality... He had no clothes at all. Unfortunately, he seemed to be the only one who didn't realize he was completely naked walking down the street showing off his new clothes. Now, in the Bible Belt, because there is a church literally on every corner in every neighborhood, we assume that God is present and moving throughout the land. The truth is, if you don't know a problem exists, how can you be expected to fight for a solution to that problem? As long as you and I remain ignorant of the reality of what's going on, we will be content to do nothing. Next, self-centeredness. 
in America, our culture has adopted this sense of uh, community, but on individualistic terms. See, we will occasionally gather around similar passions, such as uh, marital status, social class, who we work for, what team we cheer on. And then when we're tired of being around others, we simply close our garage doors, pull the blinds down, and shut out the world. Sadly, the church has been guilty of the same isolationism, but on a broader scale. We've been content to separate ourselves from the secular world on the amount of religion while developing this bad case of the us for no more syndrome. Now, as a result, churches continue to compete with, the, with each other. Uh, one pastor calls it uh, competing for the three Bs, uh, buildings, budgets, and butts. Yeah. All right, next one is apathy. Once the enemy has you in the place where you're con you've convinced yourself that you don't care about anything or anyone, uh, you lose all sense of ownership, all right? So from Satan's standpoint, What's better than keeping Christians in a place where it doesn't matter if abortion laws are enacted or schools incorporate uh, Muslim history uh, or any kind of goofy doctrine they're trying to put out there now into the curriculum? Or let's say the entertainment world continues to sink further into lewdness and vulgarity. All right? That's apathy. Another issue is resignation. Now, this is a mentality that believes that the earth, well, the earth is ultimately on a downward spiral that none of us can stop. So, there's no point in trying to do anything. And as a result, many Christians have subscribed to a retirement mentality when it comes to invading the cultural mountains and reclaiming them from the enemy. So, in essence, they're leaving the task to the, the next generation. And let's not forget presumptuousness. Hey, rather than remain humble, wise and ever reliant on the Holy Spirit is our source of power. In our delusion and exuberance, we've declared victory too soon over the mountain of religion. And in some circles of believers, we've declared victory even on other areas, other mountains of society. Well, many American believers have a uh, Basically, we rest on the laurels of our past generations. We like to bring up past victories, past accomplishments, presuming that we've already won this cultural war. And the result is just as Satan would have it. A church whose weapons have been rendered useless by the cultural climate, a church that doesn't pray without ceasing, a church that would rather return to the warm, cozy confines of home, namely, the non-secular mountain of religion. And last but not least, religious spirit. This ancient spirit, man, it is rooted in pride. It is our greatest enemy to invading the mountains of society and producing true kingdom change in this world. It's the number one opponent to a lasting revival. The religious spirit always resists change. And since intercessors are often in the front lines of declaring a shift, a change throughout the land, they're often the prime targets for the religious spirit to operate against and sometimes even through them. The religious spirit has a form of truth, and yet it lacks the fullness of truth. It operates under the guise of Holy Spirit power, but it has no intimacy with the Father to produce Holy Spirit power. I remember Chuck Pierce uh, once said, religious spirits are sent to seduce you and cause you to wander in the wilderness. So you're never going to take the promised land, all right? Okay, I'd like to briefly review 10 signs that indicate that the religious spirit is at work, all right? Very quickly. Number one, silence voice. Number two, God's silence, displeasure, and judgment. Number three, doubting God's calling. Number four, a perfectionist mentality. Number five, approval-seeking service. Number six, control and manipulation. Number seven, an unteachable attitude. Number eight, no accountability, 
counsel, or oversight. Number nine, fear of man. And number 10, twisted truth. Until the church wakes up and realizes that we are the enforcers of the victory of Christ in the here and now, bringing the kingdom of God to earth, will remain oblivious to the battle that continues to wage over souls, families, churches, cities, even entire nations. The battle that goes on every day in our midst is a battle in which the enemy has been very successful at getting God's soldiers to sit on the sidelines as injured reserves. Evangelist Corey Tim Boom once said, it is a poor soldier indeed who does not recognize the enemy. At this point, I've covered a lot, but there's still quite a bit more to go through, and I'm going to take this time to ask you another question. Do you recognize the enemy in your life? If you do, why haven't you taken action using the authority of Jesus Christ to tread on these serpents and scorpions? For the kingdom of God to first truly be established in the earth, we can no longer afford to be duped into thinking that there isn't a war that has to be fought. Now today I've presented you different types of military strategies for warfare. I've also reviewed a number of Satan's tactics or illusions that he uses to keep us from invading and conquering the seven mountains of society. There are similar tactics he uses to keep God's people in bondage and ineffective. He's destroying families and destinies and as a result, he's hindering the advancement of God's kingdom. As leaders of our families and organizations, as well as intercessors, we can no longer allow these, um, the same devices and illusions to blind us to the reality of our situation or to minimize the power and authority God has given us through prayer, intersection, and prophetic declaration. The truth is, we do have the most potent weapon in the world that can change everything. But until we wise up to the various ways that Satan deceives, distracts, removes, and destroys those who wield this weapon, we will continue to be an army with unlimited potential and yet continue to exist with minimal, if any, effectiveness. Our commander-in-chief has equipped us with the most potent weapon, and he's prepared to implement the most potent tactic ever witnessed by mankind. It's up to those of us who are informed. It's up to informed believers, which are you, because you're attending this broadcast. Heads of families and intercessors to stay in communication with him for both the weapons to be used and the tactic to be effective in the process of invading, invading, regaining the seven mountains of influence, and then delivering and setting the captives free. Now, the remainder of this broadcast is especially geared towards pastors and leaders, but I don't want you to tune out. I want you to listen carefully if you're not a pastor or a leader in your church. <clears throat> Because for men, you're the pastor and leader of your, of your household, all right? Ladies, even if you're single <clears throat> or like a single mom, you're the leader of your home, okay? So listen closely. Before an army can take over a location, it must first invade that place. You cannot legitimately claim a territory unless you have first conquered it. You can't conquer a territory unless you've invaded it in some form or fashion and actually fought for it. This truth applies to self-deliverance, all right, as it relates to our families. Folks, we must first invade the cultural mountains and fight for them. Then and only then can we begin to even think about conquering or claiming any sectors of our culture. What I've just explained to you 
is a universal order. <clears throat> it's always been in place. It doesn't change. First you invade, then you fight, then you conquer and ultimately occupy. Invade, fight, conquer and occupy. It's sad, but true. The church doesn't rule the seven mountains of society, even though it could. It, it's relinquished control over the one mountain that we've presumed for generations to control by default, the mountain of religion. It's also a sad truth that we've not even invaded most of the other mountains. Even though there are many believers stationed on each mountain, according to God's plan, many of them remain unaware of the real reason they've been placed there. And they've been placed there to ascend. They don't know how to do it. Instead, they're going about their daily business content to inadvertently serve <clears throat> the purposes of the current ruling lord or uh, strong man over that mountain, okay? I'd like to begin wrapping up today's broadcast by introducing you to the concept of invading. Again, this applies to dealing with the enemy in our personal lives and families as well. God has given his church the necessary tools and placed his foot soldiers in strategic locations throughout society, and he's also stationed prayer warriors like you and me to stand in the gap. Now, to all the men who are watching this, I want to say to you, you are the foot soldiers in your home. You are the prayer warriors. And it's time you learn what it truly means to invade these mountains, to confront the enemy in your midst. Let me start by clarifying what I mean when I say to invade. Invade, I, I've discovered, has at least seven different meanings. So bear with me. Listen carefully. To enter forcefully as an enemy. That's number one. We're not supposed to walk in timidly or secretly or half-heartedly or doubtfully or hesitantly or even secretly or in any other non-invasive uh, fashion. Once you know, we are rid of the religious spirit in our own lives, then and only then can we truly be forceful. And to be forceful is to be vigorous and powerful which in turn means having great power, authority, and influence. Now, I want to make clear to you today, this is your destiny and mandate to operate in power and authority and influence wherever you go. And to the mightiest in the spirit goes the victory. Yes, Christ in you is the mightiest in the spirit. Number two, to go into with hostile intent. Do not let the enemy deceive you by quoting Philippians 4.8 to you. You are to love what God loves, but hate what God hates. And God hates sin. So when it comes to invading those places inhabited by the enemy of our soul, we have full license to let loose on his forces with indignation there is no reason we should be hospitable to Satan. In the natural, we wouldn't welcome an axe-wielding serial killer into our house for a cup of coffee. So why in the world do we treat the devil any differently? Jesus' mere presence indicated a hostile intent to the enemy. Jesus didn't merely represent opposition, oh no. Jesus was the very opposition that signified sure defeat for Satan's armies. As intercessors and warriors, we enter the mountains of society. This includes the, mountains of, uh, the mountain of family with the same fear-inducing presence that Jesus had because we represent this imminent defeat to the current rulers of the territory. Three, to enter as if to take possession. The key word in this definition is possession. To possess is to have as property, to occupy or control from within, to dominate or cause to be dominated or influenced by an ideal or feeling, to keep or maintain in a certain state of peace, 
to seize, uh, to take, uh, to gain, uh, to make someone owner, a holder or master of property. When we intercede for a particular mountain, we, what we're doing basically is we are putting on our, our big girl panties, our big boy BVDs, and we enter the scene and we declare to the darkness, the kingdom of God will dominate you in the name of Jesus, the one whom you fear. I'm now here to take dominion. We have to be that bold, that brash. Number four, to enter and cause injury or destruction. As leaders and true prayer warriors, we are there to do damage and cause serious harm. Not to people, but you know, to the demonic forces that manipulate and oppress these people. We invade the mountains to destroy these powers or to put an end to extinguish, to, to render ineffective or useless, uh, to reduce to a useless form, or, or to completely defeat. As intercessors, we need to learn to invade and attack the enemy's weak point with the same kind of precision as small explosives that are used to implode and collapse buildings under their own weight. Just as an implosion reduces a building to fragments that are so tiny that restoration is impossible, we must reduce the powers of darkness to nothing. Number five, to intrude upon. Folks, we don't need no stinking invitation from Satan to enter the territory. We have full permission from God to just go on in, okay? Don't wait. Number six, to encroach or infringe. To encroach means to advance beyond established uh, limits of property, domain, or rights of another in order to possess. Another definition of encroach says, it is to enter gradually and often stealthily on the territory rights or privileges of another so that a foundation is barely noticed. Um, I first learned this definition when I was studying for my real estate license because uh, they wanted you to know or to be aware of, of incidents of encroachment uh, and how that impacts a person's right to ownership of property. And in, in that example, when, when, when uh, your neighbor, for example, builds a fence, he's got to make sure he gets an accurate plat of the land. And he should inform you he's building uh, about to build this fence. You need to get an accurate plat of your land as well. And you both need to be in agreement on where that fence goes. Because if you don't, when he builds that fence, he could encroach onto your property and take up to, even if it's a foot over it. So take a foot down the length of your property, that's a lot of land. That could impact the value of your property when you're ready to sell. All right? So encroachment is, is a big deal. Oftentimes, the Holy Spirit will guide us into blatant warfare with the enemy. On other occasions, however, um, stealth. Yeah, stealth is the key. Not because you know, our commander-in-chief cannot overwhelm the enemy, but because often the greatest damage is made by using the element of surprise. Okay, The higher up believers go on these mountains, the more noticeable they become. Conquering a mountain takes time. It takes patience. Therefore, we have to penetrate enemy lines slowly and enter the inner parts. Now, as the foot soldiers move up the mountains, intercessors are responsible for covering their tracks, alerting them when the enemy catches wind of their presence and fighting off the enemy in the spirit realm. Now, as we push back the darkness, we must also push those foot soldiers, the carriers of God's light, higher up the mountain to stand in the places where darkness once ruled. Number seven, to make an invasion. This is a, a powerful weapon of intercession, okay? It is still possible for the intercessors to be the ones who end up um, trampled upon and overrun. The reason for this is, it's really, a, it's really a matter of of power, but instead it's all about preparation. 
we must first gain a correct understanding of the weapons we use in warring with the enemy, and we must be skilled in using them. All right. It's my hope that today that a seed has been planted in you that will yield a harvest of knowledge that will inspire you to re-embark on your journey to successfully pursue, invade, fight, conquer, and claim the deliverance and destiny God has for you. Now, let me finish by bringing this teaching down to a, a, very, a very personal level. I want to read from Isaiah 52.2. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Isaiah 52.2. Now listen carefully. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise. Sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. This is a powerful verse, okay? And it relates to self-deliverance. If you have your Bible turned there, notice that the Lord says, shake yourself from the dust. This is an appropriate passage to summarize today's topic, spiritual self-defense strategies and tactics. We have to realize that we've been given the power and authority to loose ourselves or to shake ourselves from the dust, from all types of bondage. Zion in this passage, is a prophetic word and a symbol for the church. Isaiah prophesied that Zion would be a captive daughter. And this is so true of the church today. The church is captive, unfortunately. Even though many are saved and have received the promise of the Spirit, there are still many bondages that remain in the lives of believers. Now, how is this possible, you ask? Well, at the point of salvation, it is our spirit that is delivered, renewed, and reborn. However, our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, and our flesh still need deliverance. Notice how so many Christians are still dealing with the same issues as unsaved members of society, but We've been given a command and a promise in this passage here to loose ourselves, shake ourselves from the dust, and to arise. Deliverance is part of our salvation. After a person has experienced initial, initial deliverance at the hands of an experienced minister, he can begin to practice self-deliverance. Self-deliverance is an ongoing process. It isn't a one-time event. It takes, it takes years. You have to be at it all the time, okay? So let me encourage you to take responsibility for your life. Don't depend on anyone else for your spiritual well-being. I want you to confess the word over your life. Pray strong prayers that rout the enemy. Don't allow uh, self-pity to hold you back. Stir yourself up to pray. I know it's hard at times, all right? But when you get the word inside you and, 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 and the going gets tough, release that word. It is a two-edged sword. It drives back the forces of darkness that are trying to beat you down. This is a key to an overcoming life. It all begins with a decision. You can't allow passivity to rob you of deliverance and the life that Christ died to provide for you and your family. You have to open your mouth. <clears throat> your deliverance is as close as your mouth. Trust me, I know. I have to practice this all the time. Okay, I'm not living on easy street, folks. All right, there's, there's constant issues that I have to deal with. All right, I've got six kids. I've got four grandchildren. I've got... Uh, uh, in-laws of my kids uh, that, that that we have to consider praying for because they, they've got soul ties they're dealing with. They, they've got generational issues they're dealing with. All right. So I have to be able to pick myself up every day and position myself <clears throat> in such a way that I am initiating self-deliverance. Okay. Or ministering deliverance. Now, speaking of mouth, the power of words 
this is not a new phenomenon. All right, you guys know this. However, there is a skill level, an expertise that has yet to be refined and mastered among the body of Christ. This, this has to change if you're going to win the battle of self-deliverance and recapture the mountains of society. By now, I hope that everyone realizes that knowing how to defend yourself spiritually and ascend these mountains and engage the ruling powers destines us for a showdown like nothing we've ever imagined or encountered as of yet. In the majority of these showdowns between light and dark, the weapons of warfare are the same small yet infinitely powerful units of attack, our words. So, can we all agree that the most potent weapon we will use for warfare against the enemy in the spirit is what comes out of our mouth? Unfortunately, too many of us and we're reckless with our words. As a result, there's an issue of trust that the Lord has with us, or a lack of it, that limits us and as a result makes us vulnerable to the enemy. In the natural realm, even though we have a right to bear arms according to our Bill of Rights, not everyone can be trusted to own and carry a firearm. They must prove themselves capable of using one and also be of sound mind and character. Without this, they become a danger and a liability to themselves, their family, and society. The more God can trust us with his secrets, his word, the more he will share his secrets with us. If God isn't sharing any secrets with you, could it be that you haven't proven yourself trustworthy with keeping a secret? I'm talking about revelation that comes through prayer. The mature believer keeps God's information confidential, yet acts upon it in a responsible manner by continually taking it to the Lord in prayer. On the other hand, immature believers tend to use secrets as a cover for gossip. Gossip is one of the, the tools that Satan uses to, to negate our most effective weapon of warring in the heavens with words. His primary means of rendering our words ineffective is to distort them as they are being communicated. Today, Satan is not only attacking those who are attempting to scale the mountains, he is also desperately trying to distort intercessors' communication in the spirit realm. One of the only tactics that he has when it comes to words is to shame us for those words that we've carelessly uttered that have sown bad seeds in our own life. He holds, he holds us accountable to those words. You know, He brings a charge against us in the courts of heaven. The Bible tells us that we will be held accountable for everything we say. I believe it's actually the enemy who's going to hold us accountable because God has not come to judge us. He's come to deliver us. So how are we going to be held accountable? I believe it's the enemy. We can't continue to, to shortchange God's empowering upon our words by removing that power with wishy-washy, doubt-filled, weak proclamations. Proverbs 25.11 tells us, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. To speak accurate, timely, precise words, we have to make a conscious effort to be clear about what we say and what we pray. This is why it's essential for us to say what God says when we pray, not what we feel like saying, whatever comes to mind, no. When we declare or pray the word of God, we make a way to establish God's will on earth. When Jesus had his first uh, known confrontation with Satan, he didn't say whatever came to mind. The scripture tells us, and it's very clear on this, Jesus responded to Satan's attacks with the logos of God. It is written. It is written. 
it is written. As a result, Satan was forced to flee from him. Now remember, the word tells us, resist the devil and he will flee. There's a clue. How do you resist the devil? It is written. As spiritual warriors, we must respect and understand the power of words and learn to use them wisely. The best way to do this is to, is to learn to speak God's word continually rather than ours. Don't forget, or don't rather, don't forfeit. Don't forfeit your deliverance, folks. Deliverance is what's called the children's bread. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at Matthew, uh, I believe it's Matthew 15. Let me see if I can turn there. Matthew, Matthew 15. Yeah. And I'm going to read verses uh, 21 to 26. Matthew 15, beginning at verse 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed into the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. His disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he then answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why do you think he was sent there? Then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. He was going to the lost sheep of Israel to bring them bread. Okay, bread. From this passage, we learn that deliverance is bread for the children of God. Do you not see the connection? Deliverance bread? Go back here. It says here, what does she say? In verse 22, my daughter is severely demon possessed. And Jesus says, I can't take the bread that I have with me that is meant for the lost sheep of Israel and throw it to the little dogs. That can only mean one thing. He was bringing deliverance. The bread is a reference to deliverance, okay? It is part of the spiritual diet from which every believer has a right to partake of. When deliverance is not part of a believer's diet, the result is spiritual malnutrition. Christians need to, uh, they need bread. They need bread to endure. Without bread, there will be fainting and weakness among the people of God. The reason why so many believers are weak and fainting is because they haven't received deliverance, which is the children's bread. Just as the natural appetite cannot be satisfied without bread, the spiritual appetite can't be satisfied without deliverance. The church has been trying to bring deliverance to the world, just as Jesus was trying to bring deliverance to the lost children of Israel, but while ignoring the words of Jesus, let the children be filled first, Mark 7, 27. In other words, we can't bring successful deliverance to the world until we bring it to the church and we ourselves are delivered. Folks, bread isn't a luxury food. I don't know about you, but I like to have bread every day of my PB&J. I mean, it doesn't feel right if I don't have a PB&J every day, okay? It's a staple food. A staple is defined as something having widespread and constant use of repeal, like my PB&J, okay? It is a sustaining or principal element. Since bread is a staple food, and since deliverance is called the children's bread, then we can conclude that deliverance is of primary importance to the life of every believer. It is a staple spiritual food. It is a sustaining or principal element of our spiritual diet. Now, preaching and teaching, yes, are a major part of feeding the flock. I'm going to stress today that if deliverance is not a vital part 
of any church's ministry, the flock is not being properly fed. Now, hear me. I didn't say the church isn't being fed. I said it's not being properly fed. Feeding the church of God is more than sermons and Bible studies. If you have any doubts, simply look. Look around at the members of your church. Folks, hear me out. Understand my heart. I'm not telling you to go back and, you know, finger pointing, trying to find flaws and telling people they're liking this or like it. That's not your job. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying, be an observer. You'll see issues that they've been dealing with for a long time. Sometimes, you know, when you get in the prayer line, you notice that, you know, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, they're, man, they're up here every week. And you come to find out they're coming up for prayer for the same thing over and over, okay? So despite having been saved and hearing good teaching for years, they're struggling. Why is that? If deliverance is the children's bread, then many pastors, unfortunately, are guilty of not adequately feeding the flock. If they have neglected deliverance, again, hear me out, okay? Don't accuse me of doing anything wrong. I'm not uh, here to criticize or to point any fingers. I'm not attacking any pastors, okay? These guys have their hands filled. Thank God for pastors. I, I know I don't have it in me to be a pastor, okay? I'm just stating a truth. Pastors can only teach so much from the pulpit on 52 Sundays a year, okay? Just isn't enough time to feed the flock everything they need. However, the result of spiritual neglect from the shepherds of God's people is that they are scattered. What am I talking about? Could the neglect of deliverance cause the Lord's people to be scattered? Well, what does Ezekiel have to say about this? I wonder if I have that earmarked here. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ezekiel 34. What does Ezekiel have to say? Verse 5, chapter 34. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Okay. So the answer is a resounding yes. There is a lot more that I can say on the subject of deliverance, but I won't be able to go to, into this any deeper today because this, this teaching is, is taking up a lot of time, but it, it's necessary that I go deep into this. For now, let me just say that we cannot live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Studying and receiving the word of God is also a vital part of a proper spiritual diet. And that's in, this includes anointed preaching and teaching that you get on Sundays. It includes uh, prophecy. It also includes deliverance. We need deliverance. Okay, We need the rhema word. We won't be strong without revelation, knowledge, prophesying, and good doctrine. These, in addition to deliverance, must be components of God's people. Uh, their diet, that is. Okay? Now, I've given you a lot to consider today. I realize that. But in order to lay a deep foundation for the future teachings on this subject, I needed to lay down the solid foundation, put down as much as I can, because I've got you in front of me now. Okay, I mean, I get a second chance. So I'm giving you everything that I can. Knowledge brings deliverance. Demons would rather do their work without being noticed or exposed, people. It's part of their war tactic. Your tactic? In response to this, is to gain knowledge of their existence and their tactics. It's unfortunate that there are many well-meaning Christians, including ministers, who feel it isn't necessary to discuss or teach on demons or deliverance along with the need to know how to conduct spiritual warfare. Well, I'm not one of them, okay? Christians who spend any considerable amount of time uh, talking about demons are considered to be going overboard or they're one of those deliverance fanatics, all right? Well, truth be told, 
There isn't enough teaching in this area. Too many in the church fall into the trap of the enemy by leaving him alone. If demons are left alone, they will operate unhindered in the lives of countless individuals. I don't have the address with me, but there's a passage where Jesus encountered, uh, I think it was a demoniac, and they said, Jesus, what have you to do with us? Leave us alone. They don't want to be bothered. Okay? If they responded that way to Jesus then, they're going to respond that way to Jesus today who lives inside of you. Teaching on spiritual warfare and demons can't and shouldn't be prevented or ignored. Demons have to be exposed. They have to be cast out. Today's teaching was meant to establish a foundation and a mindset that will enable you to understand and embrace spiritual warfare. My reasoning for this was to prepare and enable you to receive your complete deliverance, bind the strong man, and to help deliver others in your family and on the other seven mountains from bondage. I'd like to close now by declaring a prayer over you. But before I do, I want to acknowledge all those ministers that the Lord has used uh, to impart to me the revelation that I've been sharing with you today. Um, I've been following some of these guys for, for years now. Um, I've sat in some of their teaching. Uh, I've watched their, their broadcast, and, and I've gleaned quite a bit from them. Um, the names of these guys include uh, Lance Wallnow. <clears throat> Actually, he was the first minister to ever prophesy over me. He, that was the first prophetic word I ever received was from Lance Wolnow. Uh, Colette Tosh, uh, Johnny Enlow, Peter Wagner, uh, Charles Kraft, uh, John Eckhart, and uh, Tommy Femright. Without their, their knowledge and experience, man, I, I wouldn't be as equipped as I am today. And uh, I'm not saying I'm fully equipped, not, not, not by a long shot. And I certainly wouldn't be able to come uh, before you and release the revelation and wisdom that God has provided me. Before I begin to pray, uh, uh, let me ask you, where you're at right now, um, if you would just take a moment, uh, just confess out loud. I need you to say this out loud. Tell the realm of the Spirit that you are giving me permission and the authority to release these declarations over you and that you are coming into agreement with what I'm about to say. If you could do that just right now for me. Okay, just take a, a moment and do that. Thank you. If you've done that, I appreciate that. I, I thank you for doing that. Uh, the reason I ask you to come into agreement with me is because I want to release the power of agreement in the atmosphere where you're at and where I'm at, okay? Because the, the realm of the spirit recognizes that spiritual principle. Are you ready? All right, if you would just bow your heads and allow the Holy Spirit to just minister to you as, uh, as I pray this prayer and release these declarations over you, okay? All right, let's begin. Father God, I bind and paralyze every destiny promoter in the life of every person present today. I declare that every damage that may have been done to your family must be repaired now in Jesus' name. Lord, restore each of them to your original design, to their lives. I declare that every power that is contending with your divine destiny must be scattered to the land of desolation in the name of Jesus. And I decree that the spirit of excellence that is of God has come upon you now in the name of Jesus. Satan, I resist you and rebuke your efforts to change their destiny in the name of Jesus. And I remove your right to rob them of their divine destiny in Jesus' name. I decree all powers of darkness assigned to your destiny are now bound and are being escorted away by the angels of God and will never return or find you in the name of Jesus. I declare 
that every incantation, ritual, and witchcraft power operating against your destinies must fall down and complete destruction in the name of Jesus. I render null and void the influence of destiny swallowers in the name of Jesus. I withdraw your progress from every satanic regulation and domination and declare you are now off limits to the forces of darkness in the name of Jesus. Every deeply entrenched problem that has pursued you, I command, must dry up to the root in Jesus' name. Every stronghold of failure, that has been discouraging you, be broken now in Jesus' name. Every internal warfare in your lives must be terminated in the name of Jesus. I declare anything planted in your lives by your enemies must come out now with all of its roots in the name of Jesus. On behalf of every person in attendance, I receive explosive breakthroughs and I decree you are now freely moving into your destiny and are now being transformed to God's very best. And I thank you, Lord, for scattering the enemies of divine destiny in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for allowing me to pray over you and release those declarations. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that this teaching has benefited you. I look forward to reading your comments, and I hope you'll join me for future teachings on this subject. Again, if you're not a, a current follower on my Facebook page, would you uh, become one today? I'd really appreciate it. And don't forget to join uh, the private groups that I've set up that are very specific in, in nature. And also, I want to encourage you to be sure to check out my website. If you're not familiar with it, you can find it in the About section on my Facebook page. It's www.rpmadvisor.com. All right. Um, there's a lot of material there as well, some other resources that I would encourage you to get a hold of. Uh, once again, thank you for joining me today. And I just want to say so long for now. Until we meet again, shalom.